Hello, Probers. Howdy, howdy. Welcome to But It Was Aliens. Aliens. The extraterrestrial comedy podcast. podcast brought to you by two former men in black. black. That's right. You heard me. We were allegedly, truthfully members of the world's most powerful secret group that kept the world safe from extraterrestrial danger. Why were we removed from the group? Well, some would say that we were just lazy, that we wouldn't get off our asses out the file room. Others would say that we were too passionate, that we were too headstrong, took too many matters into our own hands. We would say it's because they realised what we were building to, to unleash the truth upon the world. They thought they'd stopped us, but oh no, 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 we can't stop. Won't stop. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Sitting across from me is your co-host for today, Kevin Legray. Beard. And your host, the main man for today, is myself, the Walker of Moons. Granny Moonwalker. Have you decided that you're suddenly Vince McMahon? <laughs> For some reason, when I wrote it, that's the voice that went through my head. So I was like, I've got to do it. Got to stick one. to it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, when you call yourself Granny, it really froze me. Because <laughs> I never call myself. Oh, granny. when I when I say froze me, I don't mean in a good way because my mind just goes blank and I'm confused. So I just <laughs> sit here quiet. Why is he calling himself Granny? He never liked to be called Granny. I'm getting old now. Yeah. I don't mind. Become <laughs> <laughs> Granny. <laughs> so today. We are visiting a graveyard. Not just any graveyard. I love it when we go to a graveyard. But quite possibly the biggest graveyard in the world. Literally? Quite possibly. (laughs) We are heading... Hold on, hold on. I feel like if you're going to make that statement, you need to have researched that statement. I believe it is. (laughs) I believe it so much, I can feel it in my plums. Great. You can feel... Hold on, let me just get this straight. You can feel what the biggest graveyard in the world is through a feeling in your balls. So graveyards give you a feeling in your balls. My plums. We are heading to the graveyard of the Atlantic known by other names such as the Devil's Triangle or its deadlier name, the Bermuda Triangle. Ah, that makes so much more sense. (laughs) The Triangle, the deadliest shape in the world. Deadlier than a ninja star? Deadlier than a ninja star if it's the biggest graveyard in the world. Yeah, but it's... Hold... In the world. Isn't the fact that it's a graveyard merely suggestive of that's where things end up after something deadlier happened to them? But the deadly stuff happened within the triangle. But there could be a kraken in that triangle. Still happened within the triangle. The triangle can claim it. Yeah, I can see your point. It's debatable, but I can see your point. The Bermuda Triangle is located within the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean and is located between three points. Because it's located between three points, Kevin, that makes it a triangle. (laughs) Those three points are Florida, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. You did very well not to say Puerto Rico, because that's I almost... I did very well yeah, not to say it. That almost always comes out of our mouths, and I don't really know why. Okay, Florida, Puerto Rico, Bermuda. I think I, I knew Florida and Bermuda. I don't know that I knew that Puerto Rico was the other point. I think I may have... I've never probed this, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it today. I wonder if I've touched on this during a different probe at some point, so roughly know the location but I've purposely stayed away from what went down there. I think I've just remembered why I might have slightly touched on this. Pirates. New Uh, Providence, Nassau. Pirate Republic, son. 
Maybe that's why the Bermuda Triangle is so deadly. It's just pirates. Just pirates. <laughs> Airplane going up in the sky. Pirates. Boat coming across. Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I should have started with that one. <laughs> Asteroid. Pirates. An article on September 17th, 1950 by Edward Van Winkle Jones was published in the Miami Herald. I'm sorry to keep interjecting. I feel like this... Uh, Eddie the, Van Winkle Jones. I feel like the, the Jones, surname the Jones. should have ended at Winkle. I know. Jones really doesn't belong did. on the end there. <laughs> Ed, it's like... <laughs> The, the Eddie parents. Van Winkle. Sounds like such a better name than yeah. Eddie Van Winkle Jones. Jones. It's like the parents just had an empty hole in their life. Maybe they'd written really small writing and there was a bit of space at the end of the paper and I thought, that looks silly. Do kind you of... reckon that that is a double barrel surname? So the middle name would be Van. So, <laughs> Or maybe that's a nickname. On the Van! The... For example, um, his mother was probably could have been something Van Winkle, Mrs. Winkle, and um, the father's last name was Jones, so he got Van Winkle Jones. Although I don't know if that was as popular in the fifties to double barrel. I've got no idea on that. Way above my head. <laughs> so I can talk about the times when people had one name and their surname was their father's name with son on the end. Harold Sigurdsson, son, for example, the son of Sigurd. Yeah, true. Um, I was trying to think of Thor then, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> the one Viking <laughs> without a surname. <laughs> no, but it was Odin's son, wasn't it? Oh, did he have a surname? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> I feel like I should have known that. <laughs> son of Odin. I'll try and be quiet now. Apologies, folks. So this article was published in the Miami Herald and is reportedly one of the earliest suggestions that something funky was going on within the crazy triangle. A few years later, another magazine called Fate published an article, Sea Mystery at Our Back Door. What the hell? What? <laughs> Mr. Moonwalker has given me a couple of images in the research notes here. The first one that caught my eye looks like a deformed starfish crossed with one of those like dog toy chickens it's basically got a butt it's actually a starfish with a booty it's that a, starfish has been doing its squats it's literally got back that is incredible <laughs> if you were if a starfish I, I was about to say if I was a starfish that's exactly this what would, would be like at. an 11 <laughs> it's got proper junk in the trunk and then the other picture is of what looks like a tiny shark nibbling someone's <laughs> ass and it's proper clamped on there like the butt is fully out it's someone in in what appears to be a bikini or swimming costume because you can only see from the waist down and the bare cheek has been clamped (laughs) proper clamped this is a true story i uh, i got a puppy recently and it my partner made a joke about him nipping me because he's teething so he's a bit nippy so I said, careful, I'll get you. She turned around and I bit her ass. Bang! <laughs> yeah! Oh, no, 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 no. She probably won't appreciate me sharing that. Probably not, no. My puppy is a genius, man. <laughs> like, the first day he was sitting, he was given poor, he was getting down. I came downstairs on the second day, he was reading a book, smoking a cigar... Now he joins me for whiskey every other Saturday. (laughs) The next day I'd signed up to university. Three days later he'd graduated. (laughs) Now he's taken me for walks. Within the research case files for this probe, it's reported that at least 3,000 sea vessels and at least 100 planes have completely vanished within this deadly triangulo. We are going to look into some cases and stories that have happened within it starting with an event experienced by twins George and David Rothschild, a decade later before anyone really knew what was going on. Hmm. Are they pirates? They're seamen. Navy boys. Uh, I might come back to that in a second. I'd just like to quickly state that when you refer to it as 
deadly triangulo that immediately gave me Dust Till Dawn vibes and now I'm thinking vampires <laughs> are responsible for everything. Vampire pirates. Vampire pirates. Absolutely. That's it. Airplane crashed. Vampire pirate. Boat goes missing. <laughs> damn it. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn it. The puppy has also left me very sleep deprived. <laughs> oh, he's a good boy. <laughs> okay, you've got an image of the, the seaman. Have indeed. They're quite, they look quite fair. Blonde hair. I would assume so. It's hard to say because it's black the, and white. The but... documentary I watched, um, they're quite old now, and so they survived. They, yeah, because we're going to hear their tale. Well, I didn't know that. I thought you might be hearing it second hand, or third hand, or fourth hand. Is that a thing? Yes. <laughs> These twins had experienced a sudden death in their family and had to fly home. They were flying from North Florida in a small plane when their pilot started to panic and yelled his plane's instruments were malfunctioning. It's vampires! That's so fucking cool. <laughs> vampires. If anyone really If anyone releases a movie with that title, we're coming for you. <laughs> That's our golden ticket. Sharky and George, vampires of the sea. The pilot asked them to look out of the windows to see if they could see anything in terms of other planes or land. The pilot completely shit his pants and was so panicked that the co-pilot had to take over. Fuel was beginning to get low and all they could see below them was ocean. Uh -oh. But after what seems like hours, they found land and was able to land. This co-pilot was a hero. This brush with the deadly triangle affected both brothers, with one of them not flying again for over two decades. The other one was a vampire. He didn't give a crap. He was responsible for those malfunctions of the instruments in the death triangulo triangulo vampire <laughs> do we know which land they landed on just out of utter curiosity um no basically i'm hoping that it was nassau can't remember to be honest that's all i mean if you want it to be nassau oh, i'd like it to be then yeah and that's where they met the vampires that's hmm. I've got nothing. I I had a an idea and it brain farted. It went. Yep. <laughs> Gone. An average of five planes a year go missing within the Bermuda Triangle, but over fifty years ago, as many as five planes were going missing in just a day. Gosh darn. Perhaps the most infamous of these is the case of flight. 19, the Lost Patrol. What were they patrolling? Vampires? You know it. Flight 19 was made up of five General Motors TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. Sounds like more than one flight. Surely it should be Flights 19. It was December 14th. <laughs> These five were led by Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor. They were making... Chuck Taylor. Not a fan of the shoe. The soles are too thin. I was thinking of the wrestler. Ah. Uh, Not the Chucky T's. Never had a pair. I've got two pairs and I've probably worn them... If you didn't like the first twice. pair, why did you buy the second? Because they look cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was trash. hoping, I was <laughs> hoping that they would be comfortable, but they're really fucking not. The soles are too thin. Oh no! They were making a routine navigation and combat exercise. The task was pretty simple: drop some dummy torpedoes, navigate themselves to their destination, and then turn back. They weren't the only crew doing this drill either as it had been completed by others earlier that day. That's interesting, for they all would have known where they are then. Lots of people around, not so isolated. There is also a picture of 
the type of plane that they would have been flying in there for you. Okay, thank you. That looks... What year was this? I don't think you said, did you, or did you? 1940s, I believe. I was going to say they look quite World War Two era, just in style, but I'm not particularly knowledgeable in the fields of aviation, admittedly. Maybe I should ask Moxley. That's my dog's name, in case I didn't state that earlier. I'm not obsessed with my dog, though. But God, he's clever. He was cooking me dinner earlier. Where's mine? You weren't here. He's not silly. Lieutenant Taylor had flown aircraft of this type before. You'll go downstairs after we finish recording and he'll be in a three-piece suite. Suit? In the three-piece suite. <laughs> Chewed his way through, put a suit on. Dog would look good in a suit. All right, Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good boy. It's but I'm, not, unk. I'm, I'm not obsessed, though. No, clearly not. <laughs> Lieutenant Taylor had flown aircraft of this type before, clocking in over 2,500 flying hours. I wonder if he misses me. With the rest of the crew, unfortunately, not even close to his level. So you can see why he was in charge. Scheduled takeoff was 1.45, but Taylor was on the drag. So it was delayed until 2.10. They were taking off from NAS Fort Lauderdale mm-hmm. and the weather was deemed favorable with the sea described as moderate to rough. Can I ask a quick question? Because I'll forget. Mm-hmm. How do you think the term on the drag came to be? Do you think it was related to people smoking when they were supposed to be doing something? So they're taking a drag of a, of a cigarette. cigarette. Or do you think it was people dressing up as the agenda they are not? So they were I... out on the drag, no. putting on a show... I think it's the... You took that so seriously. First one. I did. <laughs> I think it's the first one, literally. Or, no, probably none of that. And the fact that someone was late, probably because they're dragging their heels. Mm. I, w- I was going to say we're educational, but we've got nothing to back that up. I'm saying it's so. I'm going for the drag queen excuse. Okay. Is drag king a thing? We are allegedly, truthfully, a educational podcast. Indeed. We research all our facts before we say them. Indeed. Although Lieutenant Taylor was in charge, it was a teaching drill, so a trainee pilot was out in front. Uh Uh-oh. I can see where they went wrong. They had completed most of the mission and were heading to their next scheduled turn. Back at the base, radio conversations were overheard from those on the mission from Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, who was preparing to take his squad out on the same training drill and he received an unidentified transmission. Vampirates. US Marine Captain Eddie Powers, who was out on the drill, was asked by a crew member for his compass reading. Powers answered, I don't know where we are. We must have got lost on that last turn. I'm not putting on impressions. (laughs) Oh, come on. I need to know what Eddie Powers sounded like. Took a wrong turn. <laughs> Cox called out to Powers over the radio. The response a few minutes later was from others for suggestions as to where they were. Cox tried again. He got a response this time and it was from Lieutenant Taylor. Cox asks what his trouble is. Both of my compasses are out. <laughs> oh, I can't fucking hold that. Oh, you can. You can hold it so good. Both of my compasses are out, and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down, and I don't know how to get to Fort Lauderdale. Impressive. (laughs) I feel like if someone asks you where you are whilst you're looking at your compass, you should probably give them the direction you're heading in at the very least, rather than... Would you know if both your compasses are broken? Mm, Maybe not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me just call Moxley and ask. Was he, when did they break, I suppose? Was he looking or... I'm not sure. Because I don't know if they would have gone down before that first radio call. Or that first radio call could have been that first person realising that the compasses don't work. Maybe. 
they should have carried a bit of string and like let it out the back of the plane so they could trace it back to their their home to their base indeed or they could leave breadcrumbs breadcrumbs in the water would have probably got et by seagulls i mean your enemy <laughs> <laughs> i'll never forget you seagulls i'll never forget you i know where you all live seagulls i'll shit on you do 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 I feel like the waves might have had something to say about the breadcrumbs too, but... Okay, so what is knocking out the compasses, I guess, is the question. Very good. Did the mechanics go out or just the compasses? Sorry, I forgot. Um, At the moment, just the compasses. Okay, so something else is going to happen in a minute then. (laughs) Well, what is knocking out the compasses? Is there a funny element to the magnetic field in this area that messes with things? Or is it vampires with their... Special vampiric magnetism, sexual magnetism so strong that (laughs) even a compass is attracted to it. Can't withstand it. I gotta have it. So the compasses aren't broken, they're just drawing them to the vampires. Yeah, drawn towards that sexual magnetism. Um, Good friend of ours, who also does my tattoos, if you're listening to this, would love a picture of a vampire. (laughs) You have been tasked. (laughs) And he needs a bottle of champagne, or she, or they. Not rum? Well, I was going to say rum, but every time we see that friend, or every time I've seen that friend, we've ended up drinking a bottle of champagne somewhere. Each. (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) Never just one. Yeah. To the point that I used to have him saved in my phone as champagne. (laughs) So Cox informed the NAS that Taylor and his crew were lost. Taylor was advised to put the sun to the left wing and fly north up the coast to Fort Lauderdale. Base Ops then contact Taylor asking if his craft is fitted with a standard YG. This is an IFF transmitter. It would allow Base Ops to triangulate their position. Taylor failed to acknowledge this request. And a short time later, Taylor radioed saying that they were heading 0, 30 degrees for 45 minutes, to which they would then fly north to make sure that they weren't over the Gulf of Mexico. I feel like it's wasting time for them to, to put a zero in front of the 30, because if it was 130, you'd say 130. If it was 230, and so on. If you're going 30 degrees, you don't need to have zero 30, do you, folks? To be fair, it could have been... Zero thirty 30 degrees due east or something like that, but I might have just not put it in. No, this isn't about you. This is about <laughs> the army. <laughs> so no bearing could be made and the IFF could not be picked up. Base Ops tried getting hold of Lieutenant Taylor again, this time asking him to broadcast on 4805 kilohertz. Again, this communication was not acknowledged. Mm-hmm. They tried again this time asking him to switch to 3000 kilohertz, which was a search and rescue frequency. Taylor was able to reply this time, but exclaimed that he couldn't switch frequencies and that he must keep his planes intact. About 10 minutes later, Taylor was again asked to turn on his transmitter for YG. Again, there was no acknowledgement and moments later, advised of his course change to 090 degrees due east for 10 minutes. A voice came over the transmission saying, Damn it! If we could just fly west, we would get home! Head west, damn it! God damn it! (laughs) But due to military rank and discipline, they continued to follow their lieutenant. Well, that was a mistake. I wonder, during battles how many soldiers have been destroyed because they took that extra few seconds to write the zero on their degrees (laughs) send the bomb zero 90 degrees east (laughs) missed out the east and died had they have not written a zero could have changed the turn the change of the war that's not a sentence turn the tide is what i was looking for but i got lost as i said i'm very sleep deprived (laughs) this is not going to end well is it We've got a lieutenant who needed to accept the thoughts of their inferiors. If you call a lieutenant your superior, uh, that's a better word. I prefer inferior, though. (laughs) (laughs) You're my inferior, damn it. Listen to me. But, sir. Well, hey, sugar. 
You know y'all need to turn around the plane. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> the weather was getting worse and radio contact becoming intermittent. Taylor radioed saying that they'll fly 270 degrees west until landfall or running out of fuel. It was believed that they were approximately 200 nautical miles out to sea at this point, east of the Florida Peninsula. Several land-based radio stations triangulated Flight 19's position north of the Bahamas and well off the Florida coast. At 6.04, there was a radio message from Lieutenant Taylor. Holding 270, we didn't fly far enough east. We may as well just turn around and fly east again. By this time, the sun had set and the weather was worse. There are conflicting reports to the time of Taylor's last message. Either 6.20 or 4 minutes past 7. Either way. All planes close up tight. We'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. I feel like you've committed to the voices now and I'm all here for it. So we've got clocks potentially going wrong as well as compasses. I don't know if that's just from uh, uh, base uh, uh, controls. We've got clocks going wrong. Come on, commit. <laughs> <laughs> we have absolutely, allegedly true evidence that clocks have gone wrong here. They don't state what time they make the message. Exactly, because the clocks have gone wrong. They don't really know. It's the sexual magnetism of those vampires pulling the hands. The, the hands are reaching for those vampires. Mm. What did they say? Where were, uh, something about they were going to either find land or run out of fuel. Mm -hmm. That's not a good... <laughs> no, it's really not. That's not what your crew needs to hear, is it? We're either going to find land or we're going to die, is basically what he's saying there. Although they probably would have been taught how to crash land. Yeah, but if you're crash land in the middle of the ocean, you're still buggered. I mean, yeah, but you've got hope. <laughs> He's not giving them hope. But then if they all go down together, there's more chance of them being found if they're together rather than... Is there, though? Because they'd cover a larger surface area if they were spread out separately. And then if one of them was found, they could let the people who found them know there's more to find. Ah. See? No. I had another thought. Couldn't they have just flown straight up? Until they could see land. <laughs> How far up do you need to go before you can see land, no matter where you are on the earth? Because um, once you hit space, you can see land. Probably an in your planes. they can only get to safely. Moxley just sent me a message. You silly bastard. Back at base ops, when it became obvious that the planes had gone missing, multiple air bases, ships and aircraft were alerted. Shortly after six o'clock, a consolidated PBY Catalina, the Catalina wine mixer, was sent out to look for Flight 19 and to guide them back. That is a picture of the Okay, Catalina. that looks like a traditional rescue wine plane. Mixer. I feel like the Catalina might meet a dastardly fate here as well. The Catalina is one of the kind of ship boats. Yeah, yeah. It looks it looks ship like a boat <laughs> ship plane. <laughs> The, the worst thing is there, I knew exactly what you meant, so much so that I didn't even click as to what you'd said. <laughs> ship. It's a ship boat. Half boat, half ship. Which half is which? Nobody knows. And two Martin PBM mariners were diverted from their own training drills to help with the search. Oh, this was serious. The picture of that plane. Are you going to post these on our Instagram at But It Was Aliens Podcast? I will try. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> There is no try. Do or do not. There is no try. At 7.27pm, PBM-5BUNO-59225 took off from Naval Air Station Banana River at 7.30. It performed a routine radio message and was never heard from again. I simply must know why it's called Banana River. At 915 the tanker Gaines Mills reported seeing flames from an explosion that leapt to 100 feet high and burned for 10 minutes. They checked for survivors amongst the oil and gasoline, but they found none. 27 fatalities were recorded that night, 14 from Flight 19, 
and 13 from the rescue crew. I knew it! <laughs> An investigation was conducted after the event. The search and rescue teams had tried for days after to try and locate the missing pilots or aircraft to determine what happened but not a single piece of evidence was ever found to conclude what happened. Ooh. It was rumored that some of the investigators were overheard saying, it's as if they've gone to Mars. <laughs> all right, all right, hold on. <laughs> that, that's a slight jump. We've seen an explosion on the floor, I assume. Uh, I'm pretty sure Mars is further than 100 feet high. That, that did make me... Stop and think for a second, though. They saw a hundred foot high explosion from what? The water? I, I think that's a little bit of hyperbole. I doubt it was a hundred foot high. Probably well, regardless, saw... if they saw an explosion, do planes explode when they I hit the water? I don't know. They might. If I mean, there could have been a malfunction in the air. I suppose if they come from high enough and hit hard enough at the wrong angle, then it could just be like crashing on land momentarily before they sink. I suppose it depends if they hit anything. Each other. They could have hit another ship. Maybe. That was in the <laughs> ocean. Maybe they hit a banana. Banana River. Why? Is that where bananas come from? Diddy Kong's banana gun. Could this be the case, though? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Could they have been taken up into the skies by extraterrestrials? Hmm. With zero evidence down below, we shall look up to the stars. Didn't think this one was going that way. In an attempt to not only study our technology, which would be primitive to them, but to study us directly, could it be possible that an alien aircraft from above caught them in a tractor beam and took them up? Using the opportunity to study us much closer, taking hair samples, blood samples and more. This isn't the first time we've covered a vehicle being taken up by some form of invisible force that also messed with its instruments or operation. And there are there is also a rumor that started to circulate that one of the planes had ditched and that Lieutenant Taylor had survived and had been saved by those from the Bahamas. It is said that he believed that he would be blamed for the loss of the others and would be court-martialed. So he decided to stay in the Bahamas and to marry an island woman. Well, maybe the lieutenant just felt the power of love. This island person had raw sexual magnetism. Couldn't be resisted. You know where I'm going. A vampire, you say? Indeed, indeed. I feel like to suggest that the planes have been taken up into the sky is overlooking the fact that we have someone who's witnessed an explosion on the ground. That's only the rescue plane. That's not the five missing. That could have just gone below the surface of the water? Or gone up. See, I'm not saying at this point that there isn't something mysterious going on here. I'm quite enjoying this and I'm open. No, but not that open. I feel like it's more likely to be something paranormal up. rather than extraterrestrial based on the accounts we thus far have. There's no evidence to suggest that they went up whatsoever. What do the investigators know that we don't? If they went up, I reckon they saw where the land was and went back down. Lieutenant Taylor didn't give their best account here though did they they should have listened to the crew tenant stubborn if, if, lieutenant if he's, if he's going by your definition then is they are his inferiors <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't listen to them around eight years ago 60 ships and around five planes would go missing a year within the bermuda triangle that's a lot which got its name around 1955 before colonization in the early 1600s, New World explorers would give Bermuda the name Isle of Devils because of the screams and sounds that could be heard during the night. Once the island was colonised, they realised that the sounds were actually coming from a native bird known as the Cahal. Is that the name or the sound it makes? That's Cahal! the name. And that is a picture of the Cahal for you. I'm not particularly fond of the look of this creature. Looks like a demon seagull it looks like a small demonic seagull with a chip on its shoulder it's got a look in its eye it's mean mugging you like like it wants to battle it wants shit to go down it's like you're queuing what outside you a nightclub and this 
This is the shortest bouncer on the door. And he's looking you up and you down. You know he wants to kick off. <laughs> yeah. He's <laughs> just looking for an excuse. So it wasn't only the sound of this bird, but also the squeals of pigs that had been washed up from shipwrecks. Now, local fishermen that live in Bermuda believe that most of the disappearances can be put down to bad weather. The weather can change rapidly, from a nice hot sunny day to stormy weather. With 15 to 20 foot seas being possible, these could easily wreck a small boat. That's logical, I guess. One of the local fishermen did experience something himself though, that he wasn't able to explain. One day he was out in his boat when all of a sudden his electrical equipment started to go haywire. The equipment had never done anything like that before. He wasn't able to fix the issue, but it did fix itself. And once it did, he realized that he was four miles away from where he was meant to be. Not only was he four miles away, but he was four miles in the wrong direction. Compass. Since that day, the instruments have never done that again. They felt the raw sexual magnetism of the vampirate. Hmm. What if vampirates can control the weather? Which would believably explain the rapid changes of the weather. Ooh. Kind of weather demons. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a type of demon, do you reckon? What, a weather demon or a we vampire? We should add that on our probe list to explore whether it exists. Because I'm going to have words with those weather demons if they're a thing. Why is it every time I'm going outside? It rains! Maybe you pissed one of them off. Are you a weather demon? I was out with you. <laughs> <laughs> but you like the wet. Not the rain. Jokes aside, we are getting quite a lot of accounts here of ship boats, was it? Boat ships <laughs> <laughs> going wrong. Oh, fuckery. <laughs> Lots of instrument failure, mainly of the compass navigation variety rather than engine failure. So it feels like there might be something going on here that's affecting Vampires. sexual magnetism. I can't think of what else it would be other than magnetism, but I can't really fathom in my mind what it would be that is creating that unless there's some sort of huge structure below the surface. Is there something below the surface? Ooh. Is this like, ah, uh, what metal would be really high in magnetism? Vampire skin. <laughs> it's all the vampires that are all there's together a... in this one place and it's creating a massive pull. There is a vampire under the ocean. Who has been trapped there because he's too horny. <laughs> he was trapped boner. there by his inferiors. His boner is what is giving off the uh, magnetism. <laughs> no one can resist. Human or machine <laughs> or animal. He can't resist the vampire. That's why the Kahor is looking so angry. Because <laughs> they want that. They can't go underwater. <laughs> I ain't got gills, man. Bruce Gurnon. Gernon was out flying his plane with his father. They had planned to fly to Miami, which was a hundred miles from their current destination. They prepped and then they took off. Within 25 to 30 minutes into their flight, Bruce spotted a giant cloud in front of them. It was too big to go over and it was coming at them quickly. It's a cloud of sexual magnetism. Bruce started to notice flashes within the cloud of light blues and whites. He started to panic, but as he got closer, he spotted an opening. A U-shape had opened up within the cloud, so Bruce went for it. <laughs> yeah, he did. As he entered the opening, the cloud started to change shape and a tunnel seemed to form around them. Love tunnel. Looking out the windows, Bruce describes being in a tunnel with anti-clockwise lines going around him. He was focused on the exit, which was ahead of him, and he went for it. The tunnel was starting to close behind them as if it was trying to engulf them. But Bruce was focused on getting out. Although panicked, he didn't falter. He got nearer the exit and got out. And as he did, 
the plane was surrounded by a strange mist. Do you reckon that Bruce flew into God's butthole, a misty tunnel of love? Is it accurate that if you go into a butthole, it clenches around you? As the the <laughs> tunnel started to close behind them. I wouldn't know. The Lord was bending over, minding his business in the sky. <laughs> <Boop>. <laughs> what happened next, pray tell? <laughs> Once out, he was able to focus on his surroundings and notice that his instruments weren't working. What he didn't realise was when he was in the cloud tunnel is that his craft completely vanished from air traffic control's radar. He was in the spirit. And a few minutes after coming out of the tunnel, air traffic control was screaming that over the radio. Once composed, they explained that the plane, according to radar, was in Miami. Ooh, wormhole? Bruce was confused. As for the amount of time they'd been flying, they should have been 80 miles away. Ooh. They continued and landed at Palm Beach with their total flight time sitting at around 40 to 45 minutes. This is a trip they'd taken many times before and would usually take around double that time. Bruce believes that they'd gone through a space time warp. This event changed Bruce's life and he has gone on to write three books on the subject. One in 2005, two in 2017 and one penciled for 2023 so has he written the last one and it's just scheduled to come out or is he still finishing it off unsure i'm getting deja vu here weirdly and this also reminded me not the deja vu um the quick journey reminded me of the philadelphia experiment a little bit have just popped up where they're not supposed to be and made the journey in real quick time. Mm. That's pretty weird. But then if the clock has stopped working as well, maybe it hasn't taken as long or maybe it's taken longer than they're aware. But then I don't think uh, traffic control would be shocked as to where they are. And also when they landed, they would have known the time. I'm getting dizzy. Hmm. I feel like I need to sit in a corner and digest this for a little bit. You could just get Moxley to explain it to you. I might do later on. Yeah. He'll put on his monocule. Now, this is the part of the probe where we turn to science and scepticism. Thank the Lord. We've covered a few bits earlier, but some scientists believe that a lot of the disappearing boats in the area can be down to human error. But some can be explained by large pockets or bubbles of methane gas which escape from the bottom of the ocean and hits ships passing through the triangle. These methane bubbles cause the sink to lose buoyancy and sink. This could sink a ship completely or cause it to sink enough to allow huge amounts of water on board and that could sink it. I have a video here for you grey nuts to show you how that could happen. Okay, I will watch this momentarily, but maybe the methane is actually the scent of the vampire below At the, the bottom. Yeah, that's his love bubbles attracting people, bringing them down to him. Yeah, I feel like you should give the vampire a voice. You love me. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, dream me. Methane bubbles. Mm. Do watercolors down there. It's really nice. I'll bring me some Baileys. No shoe. Okay, let's check this. Right, let's watch this video that I didn't <laughs> start at the start and want to watch the whole thing, even though it's 50 minutes long. Fluid Dynamics at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California is now researching just how dangerous those bubbles can be. Oh. Sex bubbles. Let's imagine a body that's floating in water. The reason it's floating, a body that's heavier than air, is that the greater you, depth you are, the greater the pressure. So a body, along its bottom, is going to feel this greater pressure, and the pressure will keep it floating. If you add bubbles, you lower the density of the water. The bubbles take up space. He's got a long finger. The water <laughs> will 
Force. My and gosh, that's a monster. So the buoyant force will decrease. As I increase the amount of bubbles, the ball will sit deeper in the fluid. Yeah. And that eventually makes sense. we get to a critical point where the ball sinks. Doesn't explain the plane so, does it? Now what might happen in the ocean is that there is a burst of bubbles. We can show that here. From a vampire. Turn on and turn off the air. <laughs> From the clenched butt of a vampire. <laughs> you can see that the ball Concentrated sinks. squeeze. <laughs> if this were a ship and it took on enough water, it would sink to the bottom and stay there. In the ocean, there is something like a methane eruption. The source of bubbles will be localized. They will rise. But there'll be water outside where there are no bubbles. But the fact that we can, it can sink there is, for, to me, that's proof that a ship can sink in the ocean. I don't need to say, I wouldn't even say theoretically. I mean, it is possible that bubbles from the ocean floor can sink a ship. I was in until he said that. Now I'm thinking he's a bit crazy. He's also dead behind the eyes. Methane gas eruptions may account for some missing ships, but they can never answer all the questions. About planes. I believe we will solve it eventually, so long as we don't deny that they're wrong. But there is one Sorry? story of I need to know if true would bend the very laws of nature. Oh. So there we had the scientific explanation of how methane bubbles could sink a ship. Hurricanes. Okay. I'm listening. Can be frequent in the area too. There's a hurricane coming through. Woo! Did they Hurricane are... Helmsley invent the dab? No. They are born off of the African coast. And over the past 100 years, they have headed towards America, but have been veering off towards the Bermuda Triangle. There are more there than anywhere else in the world. So it's quite plausible that the combination of these events, the weather and human error, could equate for the majority of the missing ships. And electromagnetic interference could be helped in bringing down the planes. But where's that coming from? That's what I want to know. So to summarize... No! <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this to me! We have the case of the Bermuda Triangle. The Triangulu. A triangle created between three major landmarks. Florida, Puerto Rico and Bermuda. We covered the story of the Rothschild twins whose pilot panicked as his instruments failed and couldn't find his bearings. Getting the twins to check out the windows for land before being overcome by fear which made the co-pilot take over and he found land and landed the plane safely. After such a scary time, this ended with one of the twins not flying again for over two decades. When we looked at the tragedy of Flight 19, in which five bombers during a routine exercise drill got lost within the triangle and couldn't find their bearings. After broken communications with base ops, the last radio message was heard and the planes and the 14 men were never seen again. I do have something to add here. They hold a memorial on the same day every year for the pilots that never returned home. Oh, wow. Cool. It's a long memory. Could they have been taken by aliens from above? Mm. A rescue effort was launched within five to ten minutes of a rescue boat slash plane being sent. <laughs> that rescue boat slash plane... And the 13 crew members on board were never seen again. That's sad. A passing ship reported seeing a giant explosion, but amongst the oil and fuel on the water, they found no survivors. Sharks. We looked into what the colonizers in 1960 was... 1960? In 6,000... 6,000? Six, six, <laughs> <laughs> 1600s. 6,000s. It's when the vampire was first formed... <laughs> Was the curse. <laughs> Merlin did it. Six thousand years ago. <laughs> Merlin's been around, son. We're scared of in Bermuda and why they called it the Isle of Devils. And that was due to the sounds they would hear at night. 
Hurrah. We hear a story from a local fisherman about how his equipment malfunctioned and left him four miles from where he should have been, but also in the wrong direction. He was in the wrong direction. Bruce Gurdon's story of the cloud tunnel was next. He left for a 100 mile trip and ended up in a cloud tunnel, which after the fact he believed was a space time warp. The 100 mile trip, which would normally take him around an hour and a half, was completed in 45 minutes. During Science and Skepticism, we looked at methane gas rising from the ocean floor, causing ships that are hit by it to lose their buoyancy and sink, or to sink enough that they take on water and sink completely. Another natural phenomenon we looked at was the effect of hurricanes in the area. So, Grables, do you believe that the phenomena surrounding the Devil's Triangle is interference from something otherworldly above? Or do you think that it could be caused by nature and man's own mistakes or miscalculations? Hmm, right. Well, on the buoyancy bubbles note, that could explain one or two ship sinking, but the amount we've covered here and we've barely scratched on surface i feel like because i feel like i've heard thousands there's of so many of more yeah. yeah yeah you could speak on this for probably 12 episodes um to be I fair it could be one we could end up coming back to yeah yeah things continue to happen there don't they but even I would, with the technology we have today i would also say in terms of the methane bubbles we don't know how often that occurs well that's what i'm saying i don't think it could explain every single one no meanwhile we have data on when and where hurricanes are, so we can match that against all the things that happened there. And I don't feel like the data is there to support that being... I think it would depend on how quick it would take for it to be born and travel before mm. we get record of it. And the guy who was talking about the methane bubbles... The, the emptiness behind the eyes just puts me off that theory. He had me on board until towards the end and something about the way he looked through the camera directly into my soul freaked me out a little bit. Now, I don't think we've given any evidence as to it being extraterrestrial. I've given plenty. But, well, you haven't, have you? <laughs> You've got nothing to back that statement up. I have. <laughs> I'm just not sharing it. You don't deserve it. You're my inferior. So I'm not saying that it was aliens. Uh. Wait, 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 because I'm still thinking about this. I feel like there is something going on here to do with the the magnetism, the compass issues, the engine malfunctions that we haven't explained. So I do actually think that something paranormal is going on here. So whilst I'm not saying that it was aliens... I am saying that it's paranormal in nature at this time because I have no idea what could be causing all this. I feel like it's just oversimplifying to say it's all because of a hurricane or methane bubbles. There's got to be like what's creating those methane bubbles even. Surely if there was something creating that significant a level of methane, we'd be able to discover it, know what it is. It feels like there's more to this one than we're currently aware of. Which opens it up. For a follow-up probe. Have you already got it prepared? No. <laughs> About to whip up part two on me. Um, I kind of agree. So I think... That it's aliens. <laughs> that it is caused by nature and man's own mistakes and miscalculations. But I'm kind of with you on what's causing that malfunction. Yeah. But is it... I suppose it would depend on... Is there just a really weird, like, high electromagnetic frequency in that area? Because we don't know what's under... Yeah, what's like, causing what's it. what's below, so we don't know what's causing it. So it could just be something in that area that's giving off that electromagnetic charge, but we just don't know what it is. Because Bermuda is on a... Um, a pyramid! <laughs> not a dormant, but a, is it a dead volcano? I have no idea. I've never looked into Bermuda, but now I kind of want to. And I was thinking maybe there's something in that that's giving off something. But the triangle itself is three points, not just around Bermuda. So, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, 
That's just I don't a tip. think that is anything. Well, that's the very definition of paranormal is not normal, isn't it? Unusual. That is true. So that's why I'm saying that it's paranormal because at this point, I've, there's definitely something going on here. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many accidents and crashes and whatnot. But I don't think we've got enough to explain it. Um, I think human error could certainly play a part in it, but I'm not saying that that's the cause of every single one of the hundreds of thousands of incidents there dating back to 6,000. <laughs> so, I mean, it could be different causes for every single incident. But again, there's a lot of evidence here to suggest that there is something going on there that we don't fully understand. There's only so much you can attribute to human error and oh. bum bubbles and... <laughs> Bum bubbles. Hmm. <laughs> you've piqued my curiosity, but then you haven't finished me off. Got you excited. Blue balls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is actually it for today's episode. I'm a little bit disappointed about that. I, I feel like there's more in, in like five years. <laughs> What's be... his name? Ah. Oh. The guy who, is it the one who did die Titanic, who every, James, James Cameron, Cameron, every several years he goes and looks at a random project. Maybe we should uh, kind of try and point him in the direction. He's probably already been there. Yeah, probably. He's probably found like a crystal pyramid under the surface or something. <laughs> crystals magnetic? Did I just solve it? Large crystals under the sea. Under, under the, the sea. sea. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us for this week's Probe. Thank you. Ah. You can find us on our socials over at Instagram at But It Was Aliens Podcast, Facebook at But It Was Aliens, and we also have our Facebook group Extraterrestrial Towers. All are welcome, but nobody is loud through the doors. Don't tell anyone. But let all your friends and even your non friends know. Let your inferiors know, but don't tell anyone. It is a secret that you should share with everyone. You can also find us. Uh, but it was aliens. Yeah. That is all from us today. Unless you sign up for our Patreon. Com. Forward slash but it was aliens. Where? For the cost of less than a cup of coffee. Because we recently reduced the cost. Because we plan to cover more paranormal topics such as sort of this. Though it did touch on aliens on the main co cod past. Cod past? <laughs> on the main podcast. There we go. We have dropped the price of the Patreon. Please sign up at the cheaper tier, not the middle tier, because we can't delete it until people move on to the cheaper tier. But there, each month, what do we probe, Granville? If you're intrigued by dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly Rasputins. Oh, no, Rasputin. No, 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 no. Oh, was it Tokoloshi? Yeah. Yeah, the little sex pest one you covered. Reincarnation. Vampires. Demon dogs. Um... One day, vampires. I'm going to find uh, one. Yeah. I was about to say, you can also find us on Patreon. <laughs> but <laughs> I have up. been <laughs> interrupted. <laughs> so that is it from us. As always, I have been the, mo the moon of walkers. The walker of moons. And he has been the grey bearded one. Remember, the truth is up there. Or down there. Hashtag Vampires. Wait, wait, wait. That's not what we say. Probe! I missed it. Probe!